improving your financing, your finances. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Sajel, who's the founder of uh, Patel, Sajel Patel, uh, <laughs> founder and CEO of Sajel L. And it's a, it is a financial consultancy and education platform with a mission to help women, and I'll put slash men because I think it, this, is a, this is a webinar about families and how we are coping during these turbulent times and what we can do to uh, understand more about uh, what's, what's available to us. But that, that has been Sajel's business and passion to serve the needs of investors and company, with a focus on female investors, I might add, and, to, and for companies to build effective financial wellness um, and inclusion programs for all their employees. And so 20 years of experience in the financial industry in North America and Asia. She is a chartered financial analyst uh, and has held positions as a financial strate strategist and analyst for many years. I'm, uh, she also, uh, among all of that, she was also a business uh, anchor or correspondent for Canada's Business News Network, BNN, and CNNBC Asia, and always delivered commentary and analysis on the Asian economy, stock markets, and corporate news to more than 300 million households. So we're in for, uh, uh, among, among other things, from Manulife and Asian women, executives in the media and entertainment industry. She's very well known in the community. So I thank you, Sajel, for leading us today. And I believe that the main points that you want to cover is to help us, um, to help all of us walk through strategies on how to manage our household financing, uh, finances during these times, and to uh, give some conversation around the whole stock market crash. So. Uh, three, two, one, over to you, Sajel. Thank you very much, Barb. Or, um, I'm going to just share my slide if I can get this ready. Let's see. There we go. I think you'll have to be a little bit louder. I can't okay. hear you. I don't know how others are doing. Can any, everyone hear me? Yep, you're fine now. Yeah. Okay, yes. great. So thank you very much, Barb and Alicia, as well as um, Sharon uh, Gilmore Glover, who is the chair for the Burlington Board and, and a huge mentor to all of us for just this opportunity to talk about personal finances. And in particular, this topic, how to recession proof your finances, because you know I feel it's so important. And given what's going on right now, it's on so many people's minds and many people are feeling stressed and not sure what to do. So thank you all. Um, for those of you who have joined, I was hoping to meet most of you in person in Vancouver, but we're just going to have to wait until, uh, until next year. So today's topic, as I said, is how to recession proof your finances. I know the immediate concern is um, how to manage our finances in light of COVID. You know, we've all, most of us, but I think all of us have seen recessions and we've seen economic downturns. We haven't seen, you know, 90% of businesses lose most of their revenue within a short time, a couple of weeks. And it's affected every industry, small and big companies and across the world. Um, so understandably, worrying about our cash flow and our household balance sheet is is real, is, is a real concern. And the big question is, of course, how long it's going to last and how big of an impact this is going to have longer term. So my objective and, um, and mission, as Barb alluded to, is, is really to help you think about your finances differently. And um, I hope to give you some tips on how to manage your own finances. I always say there's so much that we can't control. You know. Um, a lot of this is out of our control. But what I do know is that knowledge is something, um, well, knowledge is power. And with that, there's so much that we can do ourselves and we can make decisions and we can minimize the negative impact. Um, I'm very optimistic that this will pass. It will pass. You know, I always say it's, it's, it's tough. It's, 
it's like passing a kidney stone. <laughs> but on the other side of it, I do believe that we're going to be much stronger as people and more resilient, and we're gonna learn very, very valuable lessons. So I just really quickly wanted to just talk a little bit about why I started this and why I'm so passionate about SageL. Um, just to give you a little bit of context. So I learned, you know, I, I learned money values as a, as a young child from my, from my parents. I would later study it um, in school and as Barb mentioned, you know, I, I worked in the world of personal finance as, as an advisor for quite some time and doing some financial planning, as well as being a TV business journalist. And what I realized over the 20 some years was that I was really one of the fortunate ones. Um, a lot of my friends would say to me, oh, you know, you're a business journalist? Either it's really boring to most people or it's really intimidating. And I thought it was anything but, because how I felt was, you know, money touches every aspect of our lives. We want a house, we need money. We want food on the table, we need money. We want to give our children opportunities, give them education, we need money. Start a business, we need money. And even um, our economic and political systems, the way it's set up, affects our personal lives and our professional lives every single day. And yet, uh, I would say 80% of the world doesn't really understand it. It's never been really, it's never been taught. Personal finance is just not taught anywhere. And the bigger tragedy, tragedy for me was that it's not accessible to the mainstream, to the, to the masses in a way that's relatable uh, without the jargon and in a way that's empowering. So I really wanted to change that. I wanted to start a conversation, um, especially for women, because you will see women have unique challenges but I also knew that being a um, quote unquote personal finance expert was not going to be enough. We have a lot of great personal finance experts and yet we're going backwards. We're actually not going forwards. We're more debt than we've ever been as a society, as a global society. So I knew I needed to A, change the conversation, but also enlist um, bigger corporations that perhaps have skin in the game to, to, enlist them to make these changes with me. And that includes the financial services industry, which plays a huge part in my mind, um, but also corporations, because we know corporations are paying a lot more attention to employee stress. Number one cause of stress now is money. And it's usually the piece that's often left out. So I knew that I needed to engage them and, and that's really why I started the business. So today's agenda, you can see this is you know the following i do want to address why women um need to care uh, because as i mentioned women do have unique challenges i want to talk about the mindset because i truly believe financial wellness starts with thoughts and believe it or not as women we've been fed a lot of thoughts that are fl frankly BS. <laughs> and we've internalized it so much that we actually get in our own way. Um, and I know that I knew that I can't get women interested in the investing piece or anything else until I change that mindset and we have a conversation around that. So I do want to just quickly address that. And then we'll get into some of the steps that you can take to recession proof. One is uh, obviously the first step is assessing your current situation, um, understanding where you are, so you know where to go. And then looking at cash, um, ways that we can conserve cash and strategies around that. And then the last piece is preserving and creating wealth. Um, I've, lately, I've got a lot of emails and questions about people's investment portfolio, and what it means for their retirement, what it means for their ability to reach life goals. And so I really wanted to address that piece especially right now it's about preserving capital and then looking at how you actually build wealth. And of course, we'll have time for, for Q&A as well. All right. So I guess the big question is, are we headed for a recession? And I thought, given that's the title of this, that I should quickly address this. Well, what is a recession? A recession is a significant decline in business activity across an economy for several months. And 
the, the more precise definition is a contraction in GDP, um, your gross domestic product over two consecutive quarters. Are we headed for one? Well, there's still a lot of debates out there on whether we are or not. Um, it's interesting because I have seen some big economists thinking that this might be okay and we might skate through this and um, I'm still waiting for them to uh, readjust their projections. You know, we were, this is maybe a couple of weeks ago where we were two weeks in and now we're extending this. Um, but what I can say is this, you know, this pandemic that we're facing is unprecedented and it's on a scale that none of us could have really imagined. Um, major economies around the world, um, US, China, UK, um, Japan, India, and of course us here, we're essentially shut down. And what we're seeing is a demand shock as well as a supply shock. So what does that mean? It means, first of all, supply shock. If people aren't going to work um, and they're not able to produce products to sell, that's a supply shock, right? If you can't send things over, if borders are closed or trade is not happening, it's a supply shock. Demand shock, of course, is if you're getting laid off or you're having to stay home and you're not able to buy things, that's the demand shock. So we're seeing both sides of it. So naturally companies aren't making money, we're seeing layoffs and it's hurting our personal household balance sheets. The other thing I think to remember is that for Canada, 60% of our GDP is tied to consumption. So if we're not consuming, that's a huge hit. In the US it's 70%. And we can't ever forget about the U.S. They're our biggest trading partner, and they're also our, the biggest economy in the world. So they do anything that happens there actually has a huge impact around the world, as probably does China, because China is the second biggest economy. So it's, I think it's fair to say that we are headed for a recession. You know, um, I, I, I don't know if BMO's come out with their numbers, but I did hear uh, one uh, portfolio manager expecting that we're going to have a severe downturn for the next two quarters, meaning, you know, we started this probably March, uh, March, April, May, or sorry, March is the first quarter. So April, May, June, and then July, August, September. And then hopefully we'll see recover, recovery. Of course, it all just depends on how long we're shut down. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always stay positive and I meditate and I, I just think, you know, let's please let their, them find a, a treatment and a vaccine and we can get back to work. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's unknown what that is. But I always say, look, it's better to, to assume some of the worst and prepare for it and hope for the best. So why do women have to care? Well, because the financial gender gap is real. You know, I know all of you have heard of the wage gap. We talk a lot about the wage gap. Um, in Canada, the wage gap is around 25%. So for every dollar a man makes, a woman makes 75 cents. And there are various reasons for that. Sometimes it is, um, we're not being paid the same for the same role, but more often than not, it's actually because uh, we're not in higher paying positions. On top of that, women tend to take career breaks to either raise family, their children, or to take care of their elderly parents. So what this ends up being is when you have a wage gap um, and you take breaks, it means less savings, less money into your pension plan, which, it, which can be either your company pension plan or your CPP. And over time, because we're not having that money grow and be invested, it ends up being a, a 40 to 50% pension gap when we're older. It, it's huge. The other piece, and I, I did want to address this because I know most of us on this call are entrepreneurs. I looked at this stat. The entrepreneur revenue gap is around 58%. So female entrepreneurs make 58% less in revenue than men. Um, now, women, more women are in um, service or retail types of businesses. And when you're in a, that type of business, you're more vulnerable to consumption, right? Um, and more sensitive to the economic cycle. And the other piece I thought actually was uh, interesting is that 
60% of businesses, female owned businesses in Canada are incorporated, which could tell me a couple of things. One is that um, women are using their own savings to build businesses um, or, and they're keeping it quite small. Um, so there's, there might be some vulnerability there to our own household balance sheet. So when you look at all of this, it means we have less savings, right? But not only that, we also have the burden, it's not really a burden, but in a way it is, is that we're, we're living a lot longer. Um, and we typically as women live five years longer than men. So we have to have that money last as much longer in retirement. Um, and this one is not often talked about, but we're seeing a rise in the single person household which means that more and more women are not getting married or they're not finding a partner and they're living alone or, you know, divorce rates we know are close to 50% in Canada. Um, so all of these things affect us because it means that we have to shoulder more of the financial burden. And when I saw this stat, I was very shocked um, that women are 80% more likely to live in poverty during their retirement than men because of all of this. So it's no wonder that women are stressed. You know, you look at the stress data there, um, and I'm assuming that that number is probably much higher right now, but women are typically more stressed about their financial situation than men. But when we understand this, and we know that, I do believe that um, that stress can be a good thing. It can be an enabler for us to act and do something about it. So I wanted to talk about the mindset. Um, money is not gender neutral. There's always exceptions, but in general, it's not gender neutral. And there's been a lot of research done around this. And um, as I said earlier, you know, having the right mindset is really important around money before we actually act. Um, I always say that financial literacy is maybe 20% of the solution. Most of it is the behavior and, and the mindset. So I want people to challenge. I want all of you to challenge your money lens because we all have one. Um, we all have money personalities. We've been taught values around um, money and how we manifest it. And unfortunately, at a very young age, we've been told some of these things. Now, some of it's subliminal, um, but often we're told this. And so, you know, I would ask all of you to think about this. Have you been fed this? You know, because I was, that money is a man's world. Um, and in some ways it is. Men control 70% of the wealth around the world, while women only control 30%. How many women say it's not about the money? I hear that a lot. And I always say, it's not about the money, said no man ever. <laughs> I never hear men saying this, but we seem to say it. And we seem to think that it's shameful to want wealth or that money is dirty. And I would challenge all of you about that because money is a tool, you know, money is a tool to give you choice, to give you freedom. First, security, but it's also enables you to thrive. And I always say money has no power, absolutely no power until you attach values to it. So attach good values to it. You know, women are more philanthropic. It's proven that they are. And so we actually do better things with money. We take care of our family. We take care of community. And so, you know, for selfish reasons, I actually want women to be, have more wealth <laughs> for, just for that. The other thing is debunking the myths. Like I said, we've been fed a lot of BS from a very, very young age. You know, I've heard this a lot, men are better investors. I know a lot of women who think men are better investors or their partner are, they're better investors. And I can tell you, I can scream when I hear this because they're not. Um, men take a very different lens to investing. And sometimes what I see is a, a overconfidence <laughs> and sometimes a gambling mentality. You know, I've, I'm part of a Facebook group right now that's around do-it-yourself investing. And I see the chats that go on and they're punting and they're losing money. Well, women don't do that. 
And the reason why women are better investors when they're knowledgeable is because they don't, they're not overconfident and they're not arrogant and they don't try to time the market and churn their accounts, which is why they tend to outperform men. Um, because you can't outbeat the markets. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Women are risk averse. How many of you have heard this? Again, um, I would challenge that. Women are not risk averse. They are risk aware, which is very different. We need more data points to decide whether something's worth taking risk or not. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. You know, sometimes men say, you give them one point of data and they're like, oh yeah, okay, and I'll, I'll jump in. Well, we don't do that. We think a lot more holistically uh, and we are risk aware. And that's actually a very positive thing. I need to be an expert. The perfectionist in us gets in our way, unfortunately, a lot. And you've seen that analogy about the, um, the resume. You know, if there's 10 things for a job description and women can do eight out of 10, they'll think twice about <laughs> applying for a job and a guy can do four out of 10 and he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm a rock star. I can do this. Well, we kind of have the same mentality around money. Um, you don't need to be an expert. You need to know basics, but you do not need to be an expert to be able to build wealth. And I don't mean just investing. I mean, debt management. I mean, estate planning, all of it together. So I would ask you to change that narrative, you know, we're risk aware, and that's a good thing. We are resourceful. All of you are resourceful. You'd never be able to start businesses if you weren't resourceful. So trust yourself that you can figure things out. Investment of time. Okay. I hear this a lot. Well, I, I don't have time to manage my money. I don't have time to even learn about it. I can tell you it doesn't take a lot of time to learn this. It feels like it because there's just so much information we're not even sure where to start. But you can learn this within, I would say, 10, 15 hours, the things that you actually need to learn, um, maybe another 10 hours to set it up, and then you review your portfolio or review things a couple times a year, maybe even once. It really does not take a lot of time. I would say prioritize. We always make time for the things we want to prioritize. So change that conversation. I will prioritize time to whatever because it's worth it. And the last point I wanna make is around the shame and fear. Reaching financial wellness, again, has nothing to do, well, very little to do with literacy. The bigger obstacle for a lot of women is the shame. We tend to think that, you know, we should have known better or, you know, and I hear this a lot. Well, I feel stupid that I don't know about investing or I feel silly or, oh, I made a mistake. Well. <clears throat> This, again, it wasn't taught, this is not taught anywhere. If you were fortunate to have financial advisors as parents or people, parents who really knew, you were one of the lucky ones because I can tell you the majority doesn't, they don't know this. So again, I would ask you to change that conversation. When you know better, you will do better. Um, and I do believe this. I believe we all deserve an abundant life. All right, so let's get into assessing the current situation. Um, obviously, it's really important to understand where you are today, what you have to work with, so you know where you want to go. So I've broken it down to two parts, but we'll first start with this one, the cash inflow and savings, right? In other words, what resources do you have right now to work with? Um, expected salary or revenue from business. So if you happen to have a salary, and I would take this, if you have a partner, then I would look at this from a household perspective because that's important. So maybe your partner has the salary and you have the business, but look at it as a whole. So you want to know right now, what are you expected to get over the next few months? And that may mean speaking to your employer, um, and looking at what could change that. And so you wanna have a good idea over the next few months of what is coming in the door. Again, from the salary or the revenue from your business. There might be stuff that you've done. 
um, and you're just, you're collecting, you know, as a receivable, um, you've sent out invoices and you're going to collect this, or you could have ongoing revenue stream for a while, but you definitely want to know that figure and have a, a ballpark figure what that's going to be over the next couple of months. Um, obviously, government support for the home um, and possibly business, depending on how you, whether you're incorporated or, or you know, a, a sole entrepreneur. But we obviously know there's the government has announced support packages. Um, I expect more to come, possibly. They take steps and they reevaluate and then they do more. But take a look at that. Um, whether it's EI or your CERB, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, and whether you're uh, uh, applicable to get that, and I'm assuming that some of you will be. So you want to be able to take, the, take a look at that. The other one is if you have children, there's the Canada Child Benefit um, and top up that they've announced as well. So take a look at that because um, CERB, I just have some of the figures here. Obviously, that could be $2,000 per month, up to four months. Um, and the other thing is, you know, they had the eligibility for people who had income of, of at least $5,000 in 2019. What I have learned, and this, again, depends on your situation, if you are incorporated and you are paying yourself dividends and not a salary because that's a lower tax bracket, something you want to discuss with your accountant, but apparently that actually counts towards this. So that's, that's positive news. So you just want to take a look at what is available. Now you might have investment income as well, and this could be actually from an investment portfolio. You might be getting dividends on a regular basis. It might be property. Um, so you want to calculate that as well and figure out what you're, what you're going to get over the next few months. Um, you might have a side gig on top of what you're doing, right? I'm going to get to the cash savings and liquid investments in a second. Essentially what you're doing here is creating a budget. <laughs> a lot of people don't like budgets, but you know, I always say do this. If it really pours, you have a pour yourself a glass of wine and figure this out. But um, you could probably do some quick calculations around this. The outflow, right? We all have discretionary household expenses. So you want to have some idea of how you're spending your money, what, what's going out. Um, there's this discretionary, I should have actually put variable in there because variable is really utilities. Um, discretionary is just your meals and entertainment, clothing and stuff. And, and look, chances are that's dropped down quite a bit. Discretionary spending can be around 30% for the average household. So you probably are saving quite a bit there. Um, then there's the fixed spending, right? Your rent, um, your mortgages as well. So you want to know what that's, how much money you're going to have to spend over the next few months. Upcoming expenses, I threw this in there as well because sometimes we forget that there is these one-off expenses. There could be, I mean, tax bills are being pushed back, but there could be insurance policies that come up or, or something else that you need that you may have to pay over the next couple of months and that might throw your um, cash net, your net cash position off. So you just want to make sure that you have that figured out. And you see that I have the net cash flow position. So you'll know by month by month whether you're sort of in the negative position or uh, a positive position. And the aim, obviously, is to be in a positive position, but also to have some cushion around it. If you don't or you feel like there needs to be a top up, then you actually go back and look at, OK, well, what do I have in my bank account? You know, what's the cash savings that I have? Um, do I have liquid investments? So you could have a non-registered account that means not an RSP, but money investments that you might be able to pull from. That's, and I say liquid because if it's in stocks or something, you might be taking a loss right now. Liquid more probably would mean liquid and safe, like bonds or GICs or something like that, if you need to tap into it, okay? Um, obviously, I have the credit card debt and the personal loans there as well that would feed in. 
um, into that. So I hope that makes sense. So remember the objective is really just to have a positive cash flow balance. And I say over the next couple of months that you wanna do this um, and you wanna be able to build a cushion. Now, hopefully some of you have the three to six months emergency savings that you can tap into, but I recognize that many don't, right? And you wanna be able to try to build towards that, which is why I was saying the cushion part. If you don't, or if you find that, you know what, I actually would feel much more comfortable if I had a better um, cash flow or a cushion there, then we can start looking at, okay, well, what are the things that we need to change to get us there? Um, household. So I'll talk about this first. Um, I always say, discuss your cash goals. So if you know you're going to be short or you know, you know what, I actually really need the emergency fund and I need some cushion, talk about it. You know, um, I always say it's really important to talk about it as a couple or even as a family if you have kids, I mean, not small kids, but teenage kids um, to discuss this because it's really important to have everyone on the same page, obviously, and working together. And often what ends up happening is a lot of parents leave out teenagers from this conversation. Um, and I urge you not to because teenagers are incredibly insightful. Um, and I feel, especially now, seeing what we're seeing, that they will learn incredibly valuable money lessons. You know, two weeks ago, I ran a um, how, to, how, to under, how to budget and understand credit cards for teenagers. And um, it was interesting because I had some parents on it as well. And they said, wow, my, you know, my child was talking about this with us. And we actually had some, for the first time, we actually had discussions around money. And I said, because they're seeing what's going on around them. They're not only worried about you, but they're seeing their friends, parents lose jobs. And, and it's really a time that they want to understand this and want to be part of a solution. Um, so I always say, discuss it as a family. Cut discretionary expenses. Now, again, most of you probably have done this already, um, but there's sometimes things that we don't think about. And again, as a family or even with friends, you can get really creative and thinking, okay, well, what else can I cut? Well, subscriptions, you know, you can cut subscriptions if you're short money. Gym memberships, if you haven't done that. Um, cable, <laughs> sometimes it's just dropping down to the basic package. Uh, somebody had mentioned car insurance. I didn't think about this, but if you're not driving to work all the time, you probably can... Um, change your car insurance to more of the leisure and you save a little bit of money that way. Food, um, depending on where you grocery shop, you know, it might not be the time to go to Whole Foods if you can help it and you're really struggling. It might be the go to Food Basics or No Frills for your basics. Um, it's funny, my mom uses Flip. Uh, if you ever have that app, it's great because you see all the coupons and everything else and a lot of stores actually price match. So she's the queen of doing that. <laughs> um, lights, utilities, turn lights off. You know, So there's a lot of ways to cut discretionary expenses that sometimes we don't think about because we're on autopilot. But if you need to, there is an area there. Consider delaying fixed costs, right? Um, mortgage deferrals, if you find yourself in this situation. Uh, I was reading the other day that the big banks, they've already deferred about 10% of the outstanding mortgages. Um, now, I know there's caveats to this, that when you do that, the, um, the interest does accrue. Um, so you do want to speak to someone about this and see if, if it actually makes sense. But if it does and it's something you have to do, then you shouldn't feel shamed in doing it, right? Um, utilities, again, if you have to cut back or you have to delay paying a utility by a month or two, call your utility provider and speak to them about that. Um, deferring loan payments as well is an option, could be an option, I should say. And one's saving interest uh, costs by swapping high interest loans 
for low interest loans. It, it really depends again on your situation, but um, you know, credit cards are really high interest loans. And we know that banks are working with us now. They, they temporarily dropped rates. Um, some of the banks, you'd have to look at the company and actually talk to them individually. Um, but a lot of them have done this. And again, you'd have to look at the specific situation. But if you are in a lot of debt, and so there is an opportunity to look at that, um, whether that's getting a personal loan, um, interest rates have dropped. So that might be the option, an option to pay off some of the high interest loans. Um, the HELOC or the home equity line of credit. I know um, a lot of people are talking about that as well. Um, let me just say this. The, the good thing about that is they are, they tend to be low interest and they're fixed pay, they have flexible payment schedules. But for those, it really depends on the specific of your agreement. So it's really important. It just depends on who's going to do it with you. So I would say, read the fine print and understand your options there. It might be a place to start. Essentially, it's a second mortgage line of credit if you find yourself in this situation. Um, the bad or the risk that you take is if payments are missed, um, the house is at risk for foreclosure. So you just wanna be really careful about some of those options and understand it. And I always say, get everything in writing. Um, even when it comes to credit cards and if they're cutting it, um, you don't want it to affect your credit score. Hopefully it doesn't, but um, if you can't get in in writing, make detailed notes on who you spoke to, what they told you, time, all of that. It's really important to have that. I wanted to touch on the business side of it. Um, I know that there's been other seminars and there's people who are experts at this part, um, but I just, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it just because, of, well, for those people who are sole entrepreneurs or are using their own personal cash to fund their business, because I always say the two are interlinked. You know, um, if you're struggling with your home, finances, your home household balance sheet, it's going to affect your business and vice versa. So I just had some examples there that you may want to think about. And again, if you have a banker or an accountant or anybody else, this is, you know, um, where you would talk to them about it. And again, I know Grow Your Biz has a lot of great resources and, and better experts than me to talk about that side. But, you know, making sure that your financing is remains feasible is really important. Decreasing your variable costs. Um, ex expediting receivables and extending payables. That's really about cash management, right? Um, can you get the money in? If you have invoices out and someone owes you money, can you get it in faster than what you're paying out? Um, so you have some cash. If you're in a business where you have lots of inventory, well, inventory management or buying inventory in bulk, that's expensive. So can you look at reviewing that and seeing if you can cut back costs? Um, I know some businesses now, they're selling a lot of their inventory um, because they don't need it right now for those who do. And then consider alternative revenue streams, diversify fine if you can at this stage. Okay, so now we're on the preserve and create wealth part. So I think it's safe to say that right now, um, the focus is mostly on preserving wealth, given that we've seen the kind of markets that we have over the last month. Um, markets have been pretty ugly. <laughs> and incredibly volatile. You know, we saw a huge sell-off, we're seeing it back up a little bit. Um, so what do I tell people? Well, mostly ignore the noise. You know, if you're someone who watches the news and sees the market commentary day by day, it can get very frightening. You know, you see headlines like market meltdown and we're embarrassed market territory and we've seen a crash and historic losses and 
and things like that. I did this for a living for many years. And you talk about the news of the day. And I always sort of joke around that I was get, getting paid sometimes to create this noise. For most people, unless you're a day trader, a lot of this does not matter. So I always say, ignore the noise. And, and when you have, and you can gain perspective of what to look at, you're gonna be in a much better position to understand what you need to do, okay? So this is a chart of the Toronto Stock Exchange and you can see um, it's a five-year chart. So you can see, you know, in 2016, we were down and then it went up and now we see this crash. So it looks like we're back to the 2016 level, probably even worse. And then we're ticking back up again. The sell-off that we're seeing is really a reflection of corporate performance, right? The ability of corporate corporations to actually make money. And what I will tell you is what ends up happening First of all, we had seen such a great run up. I mean, for 10 years, we've been in a bull market where it's sure you see bumps, but it's trending up. And so for the longest time, see at least a year, everyone was sort of talking about a sell off and a recession coming. We didn't expect this to come, but you know, things were getting really, really expensive in the stock market. So we were talking about it for a while, but what ends up happening is when we get news like this, in a sudden shock, the tendency is for people to the investors to sell, and it's the big players they sell off, um, and it's kind of like sell on rumors and ask questions later, and that's the huge hit that we saw. Markets tend to overreact when this happens, um, but it's really hard to say. Right, right now we don't know how bad it's going to be, and you're starting to see a little bit of a tick up because people are thinking, well, you know, it might be a good time to buy or not. The thing is, we don't yet know what the real damage is. This is my point of view. Um, corporations still have to come out with their numbers and to be able to tell us. It hasn't been long enough for them to say, you know what, we actually know in the next couple of quarters that things are going to be bad or not. So the markets still yet have to kind of reflect that. Um, but that's what I really have to say is just about this, what's, what's actually happened in the short term and what we've been seeing. And this, is, this happens to be the TSX, but we're actually seeing this globally. The real important part is this one, you know. Now, this is a chart from, boy, 2008. So we're going quite a ways back. And this will give you a little bit more perspective. And that is, you'll see that even though we've seen some downturns and some dips, the overall trend tends to be upwards over the long term. If you have stocks in your portfolio, just remember that stocks are long term play. You hold stocks for five to 10 years. And I'll get into how you actually look at it down the road, but they're a long-term play. So while you see dips right now, this is going to recover. It may take a few years to do it. It may be shorter than that, but it recovers. And like I said, the long-term trend tends to be up. What really matters when you're looking at your investment portfolio is actually what the cost was. What did you buy the stock at? So, you know, I was hearing and I, I did a TV interview a few weeks ago on the markets and, um, you know, the headline was, oh, seniors or retirees are seeing their, mark, their portfolio completely blow up. And I said, well, actually, if they were in this for 10 years, well, we made 80%. If you're in the U.S. market, it was up 200%. So if we're down 30%, you're still up. It just depends on when you bought it. And I would say, if you have a portfolio, just take a look at, you should see what your average cost is. And then you'd know where you are now and you could surprise yourself and you could be up still 20%. So it's important to look at that. Um, the other part that's important is your need for investment income. That actually matters more. So if you have a portfolio and you are using it to fund your lifestyle or your whatever it is, you're taking money out from your investments to use it, then chances are 
you are already in um, a diversified portfolio where a portion of it is liquid and safer. Doesn't mean that it hasn't been impacted, but it probably hasn't been impacted the way stocks have been impacted. So you want to look at that piece and say, well, am I getting income from this? I'll give you an example. So my dad has Sun Life shares and he doesn't really understand the markets. And it's funny, he gets his dividends. He just got his $500 check. He gets it every quarter, you know, and he was panicked. He said, oh, well, the Sun Life shares are down and, you know, it was $56 and it was $44. And I said, dad, do you need the money? And he said, no. And I said, okay, but you're getting your, you're still getting the same dividends, right? It's like, yeah. And I said, then don't worry about it. Do you need to sell the stocks? I said, no. I said, well, then you don't worry about it. You're still getting the dividends. Um, if it drops to a point where the company has to think about cutting the dividends, it's a different story. But, um, you know, I think for Sun Life and a lot of the banking stocks, they're, they're well capitalized that they'll be okay. I don't know, but right now, all the signs say that they're going to be okay. So that's part of, part of what you have to look at is, do you need income from it? If you don't, and that portion of your portfolio is in stocks, and you're not touching it, and you don't need to use it, then leave it, because the market will recover. Um, and then you can think about rebalancing when it does, because you should be rebalancing if you start needing the income. And I'll talk about that in a second. So I hope that makes sense. The last point I will say is the government always favors the market. <laughs> you know, everything we see is to really prop up the market because they're propping up corporations in the long term. Um, we saw the central banks pump liquidity into the, into the markets, what we call quantitative easing, to make sure that stock markets are functioning and that credit is still available, all these things. And so in the long run, even though we may see falls like this and it may take a while to recover, you have to understand that the government, they will do whatever they need to do to make sure that there's um, a recovery in the stock market. That's exactly what the last 10 years actually have been about after the financial crisis. That's why we have seen the run up that we have. So I talked about the portfolios and I just wanted to give you an example of this so it's clear for most people. Okay, the first one we wanna look at is what we call a moderate portfolio. And this is just an example, okay? Um, moderate can look different ways. Right now I have, you know, 70% are in bonds, fixed income, which pays interest, fairly safe. If you hold it to the end, you're going to get the money back. 15% um, of it is in stocks and then the rest is sitting in cash. That's a moderate portfolio. Every, every strategist has a different definition of what they call moderate. So it might be 60% cash and 20% equities, but I just want you to understand the theory around it. And when you would be in a moderate portfolio? Well, a moderate portfolio is, is usually for people who have a low risk tolerance, which is why you have a very small portion of it in equities or stocks, right? Most of it is in safer bonds type. Um, you have a short time horizon, meaning that you are either, you're probably in retirement. If you're in retirement, you probably have this kind of portfolio or you have a high need for liquidity. So you actually use your portfolio to fund your lifestyle. So the fixed income part, if it's 70% of it is bonds and you're getting cash and you're getting interest, you're probably living off of it. That's a moderate portfolio. And that's why I was saying that, you know, for retirees, if they were in something like this and they're saying, well, the stock market dropped, well, it's only a portion of it that probably was affected. Hopefully they're in a portfolio like this. Uh, that's a moderate. A balanced, is one where you have a bigger exposure to equities, a smaller portion to fixed income, but you still have fixed income and cash. So you really want to make some money on the markets and you're willing to take some risk, but not a lot of risk. You still have something that's moderate risk, which is your fixed income and your cash portion. Here, your time horizon is around medium. So you would be in something like this if you were getting close to retirement. 
or you just don't want to take a lot of risk. You know, you want to take a little bit of risk to make some money, but you don't want to take a lot of risk. So you would be in something like this. And the last one is, I just gave this example, an aggressive portfolio. So you're young, stock markets will fall, but you have lots of time. You have lots more exposure to the stock market. Um, you know, my nephew is in something like this. He's very young. He's 21 years old. He's like, oh, my portfolio is going down. I said, well, don't worry about it because you're not touching the money for another 40 years. So, you know, you're going to have the opportunity to actually buy stocks and buy into the market because it's going on sale. So he's, he's in a good position. So that's, I wanted to explain that. Where it becomes important is rebalancing. And I will talk about that. So if you're um, here, if you're in the aggressive portfolio and you're getting older, then eventually what you want to do is actually move into a more balanced, right? Um, you want, as the equity portion goes up or, you know, um, you're seeing that, you know what, my equity, I'm not getting, it's run up so much and I'm getting uncomfortable with the risk. I'm going to sell a little bit and I'm going to put my money into either cash or fixed income. So you, you eventually, as you retire, move towards a balanced and a moderate portfolio. So the mistake that people make in building a portfolio is the not rebalancing. Um, it's really important to review your portfolio at least once a year, um, or you have a, a significant life change and you wanna say, does, this, does my portfolio still make a lot of sense? And this is sometimes where what I'm seeing right now is where a lot of people have been caught because it goes to the second point that I have there, letting emotions dictate decisions, right? When we see the stock market go up so much, so for example, you have 60% stocks and 40% bonds a couple of years ago. Well, if the stock market value is going up, it's naturally, your, the portfolio is gonna change. It's now going to be 70% versus 30, just naturally because the stock market's done so well. Well, all of a sudden you're offside, you know, you're thinking, well, um, I should be, I don't want to take that much risk. But what ends up happening is people say, oh, but the stock market's so, doing so well, I should just hang in there. And then this happens and people get worried, right? Or they panic. And that's where the discipline comes in. It's making sure that you're always rebalancing. It doesn't matter how the performance is doing. Um, it's always making sure that you're in line with your life goals and your risk tolerance and you're in a, a balanced, diversified portfolio. And that's where I see people make the biggest mistakes. I'm seeing it right now. Right? I'm seeing older people thinking, oh, well, this might be my time to get in the market and I'm just going to bet all my money and, and bet on the stock market. Well, no, if you're retired, that's not what you want to do. You want to keep to your portfolio and be very disciplined around it. And if you have an advisor, if you're fortunate to have one, they will work with you on this. Skipping down here, not learning the basics. Um, I always, this is really important. You know, sometimes what ends up happening is we just hand over our financial, our portfolio and everything else to someone. It could be an advisor and we don't really pay attention to it. And I always say, I said, the investor always pays the price for that. It doesn't mean you have to be an expert, but you need to be a partner to whoever it is you're dealing with and understand the basics of it. Because at the end, if they mess up, and I've, I've seen this in the last couple of weeks where friends and just followers have come to me and they said, I, I don't understand this and I'm working with them on the portfolio and I don't even understand what they've done. Um, and sometimes it's too late, you know, I'll say, well, why did you, why did your advisor put you in something like this? And they'll say, I, I don't know. Y you have to know, you know, that's where you be a partner and make sure that you're working with them and you understand why they're doing what they're doing. And it doesn't mean you have to follow the markets and be an expert. Absolutely not. It's just understanding what makes sense for you. The last piece I would say is not investing at all is a mistake. You know, um, interest rates are so low right now and you're not making any money in the bank. 
uh, it's certainly not keeping up in, with inflation, which means the value of your dollar is actually going down. And if you saw my statistics on women and how much further we have to go to be sort of equal to men, one of the greatest equalizers is actually investing. And it doesn't mean you have to take a lot of risk. It means making sure that your portfolio grows to a degree. I know we're getting short on time, but I'm just going to say this, you know, and it'll be my last slide is the power of compounding. You know, when you invest and you start off slow, you think, yeah, it's not really doing a lot for me. Well, compounding is the snowball effect of money making, um, making money on itself. And I'll give you a really quick example. It, this chart looks really complicated, but if you look at Noah over here, Noah decides that actually, no, we're gonna start with Quincy, okay? So Quincy starts investing at the age of 25. And they, he puts away $10,000 every single year and he stops at age 35. So he only invests $100,000 and then he stops and his portfolio earns six and a half percent over time. Well, by the time he's 65, he has $950,000. That's the power of compounding. You know, it starts off slow and then it goes up. And look, he only did it for 10 years. You have Lila who started at 35. So she started 10 years later than Quincy and invested for 30 years. So put in a total of $300,000. But because she started 10 years later, she didn't have the power, the time to work with her for compounding. And where is she? She has $920,000 roughly. Then you have Chloe who started at 25 and invested all the way until 65. So $10,000 every single year, $400,000, and she's ahead of everyone. You have Noah who did the same thing as Chloe, except put it in low risk. You know, didn't want to take a lot of risk and that he's behind everyone. So it goes to show that you have to, you want to earn a little bit of money but it's also when you start investing, that's even more important than how much you invest. And I show people this slide and it shocks people, but the reason it does is because we're not used to thinking um, exponentially. We think linearly. And it's exactly what's happening with COVID right now. You know, we never thought that numbers, you know, you see a couple of cases, oh yeah, but we only have 10 cases in Canada because we think linearly. So we think, oh, well, 10 cases, well, what, in, by next week, it'll maybe be 20. We don't think exponentially. And that's one of the lessons we're actually learning with COVID. And it's sort of similar with portfolio. It starts up slow, but then it grows quickly. And which is why I always say there's a power to investing. The last part is really, I just wanna mention that for those of you who are interested in learning more, not just about investing, but just financial planning and how to set goals and budgeting and everything else. I'll be launching some on online courses soon. I typically run these workshops in person because I feel that it's just much more impactful. And you know, when you have a group of women together and we learn together, it's much better. But obviously given the situation, it's not gonna happen and I don't know when it's going to happen, but I didn't wanna not have something or resources available. So. I am moving, I'm in the process of moving all my courses online. Um, and so I'm hoping that that's going to be available. It should be available by May 1st. So I just wanted to mention that. And that if you are interested in my newsletter, you can go to my website and sign up for my newsletter because I, I send that out bi-weekly. And it's just some information there. If not, my website, if you go under Master Your Money here um, and you scroll down, I have tons of articles. They, they tend to be evergreen, so um, usually doesn't go out of date. And there's some information there. Thank you. Thank you, Sajel. Uh, we've run out of time. It's 10 a.m. Uh, so I don't know how many questions uh, have come. I see on the chat. Uh, Alicia, uh, how many? I know there have been some questions that have come, but we're open. I'll uh, we can unblock everybody now and uh, show the full video. Great, thank you.
uh, very, very, uh, lots of lots of food for thought there. Wonderful presentation. And uh, I know that there were some questions that we definitely want to make sure that we address. Yeah, so is it, I can address these pretty quickly. It, okay. um, Barbara, I think you asked this, is it a good time to buy when the market is at a low? And would you invest now? Correct. Here's the thing, you can't really time the markets. Now, I personally am watching this and I think there is more downside just because we haven't heard from corporations. But again, you can't time the market. So what I would say is if you wanna buy in, don't do it lump sum, buy incrementally. And it's what you call, what, what it's called as dollar cost averaging. So you buy in a little bit at a time. Now you might buy at a higher price and then the market <laughs> go down in a month and you might buy at a lower price. But the thing is it averages out. So, um, And yeah. then the other question is what, uh, I'm sorry to ask this one, it should have been on that same question is, so what age is too late? So, uh, <laughs> I, and I'm asking that is because I actually have a 50 year old son who's saying, I think I'm going to start doing this instead of real estate. Yeah. And that's where his, in his person is saying, Oh no, no, don't invest now. It's too low. It's too low. We have to, it hasn't tanked yet. And I'm going, I don't think that's really good advice, but yeah. I'm not a financial advisor. Yeah. Uh, but I think that is a good question is that, yeah. is that this, you know, what age is too late? Cause you're looking at 25 year olds and we have to be realistic and say, you know, there's been a lot of 40, 40s and 50s that are just starting to look at this. Yeah. So what I would say is it goes back to the portfolio and the allocation. Um, yeah. You need the money. If he's 50 and he's not going to use the money, he can. But again, as you, as you approach it, you don't want all the money in the stock market. You want to be diversified and have some in bonds and have even, you know, in different countries and commodities. So because everything works differently, everything reacts differently to the economy. So it's never too late. And I always say, you know, there's good quality stocks out there. You can buy mutual funds, you can buy exchange traded funds, which are more diversified. So you're not actually doing the stock picking. And that way, um, the idea is you're reducing risk for it. But the main thing is it, is you're investing for what your goals are. If you're 70, you can invest, but maybe you don't want to be in the stock market or you want very, very little amount of your money in the stock market and the rest is actually more bonds or cash type investments, if that helps. What were the other ones? Was there anything else? Uh, I heard I that mortgages. Uh, yeah, Greg answered that one. Yeah, I'm hearing that too. I'm not getting a clear answer on this and I've asked a few people and again, I think it's just really important that if you do this, get get things in writing. Um, I haven't. I don't know if anybody else has heard. Yeah, it. I think we did. We heard it. Yeah. Mark and uh, Bimo. And yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, there, it's not going to affect credit ratings at all. Okay. At okay, all. Good. I've heard the same thing with credit cards too. That it might not. But again, people are saying get it in writing, just in case. I think the credit cards is a totally different story, but I definitely know that it's not mortgages. Yeah, that's good to know. And what was, uh, Greg, what does ETO stand for? Yeah, only when you refinance. It. Greg, what does ETO stand for? Only when you refinance an ETO. He might have left, he said thank you. Greg's left. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Oh, equity takeout. Mm. Oh, okay. Still here. No, nope, not sure. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, equity takeout. Okay, thanks, Grace. I know this was a really long presentation. It was a lot to, to cover. <laughs> Hopefully, it was very helpful. Very yeah. helpful. And I know what Alicia will do now, uh, Sajel. I think she talked to you about it. That we will uh, we will place your uh, webinar uh, on our. You can access it through YouTube. She'll give everyone the link that uh, that uh, that uh, signed up for it, as well as your deck. I think your slides will also be presented. Sure. All of your contact information. I think that's great what you're doing on your online courses. So we will we will continue to promote that. That is great. You know, just continue to send us. When does it actually start? And um, that's fantastic. So any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, great. 
Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for participating. And um, stay healthy, stay safe. Stay and uh, oh, wear pink today. I forgot. It's pink day. <sighs> oh, good for you. I didn't I have, have anything pink. That's too pink. Scarf. Okay. Take care. And Take happy care. Thank you. Jewish friends. Happy Easter, too. Bye. Bye.